recording and here we go. <laughs> Thank you, Sophie. Welcome everyone. Sophie started sharing her screen. Welcome to our information session for the Middle Housing Project. My name is Terry Harding. I'm going to do the first part of our presentation and then our staff members, Sophie and Jeff, will be doing a part. So I think our next slide has some introduction information. Sophie, next slide. Great. So I'll let um, Sophie and Jeff introduce themselves. My name is Terry Harding, as I said. I use she, hers pronouns, and I am the project manager for the city's Middle Housing Code Amendments project. I'm also the principal planner for the long range planning team and really excited to be here. Sophie. Hello, everyone. I'm Sophie McGinley. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm the public engagement lead for the Middle Housing Project, and I'm an assistant planner for the community planning and design team. And thank you for being here tonight. I'll pass it over to Jeff. Hey, Sophie. Yeah, my name is Jeff Gepper. I'm a senior planner, and I work on the short range or current or land use team. Uh, we have lots of different names. And I'm here as kind of the technical expert from a code perspective. I'll hand it back to you, Terry. Thank you. Um, Jennifer Knapp's here too. She'll be taking notes and um, responding to questions if any of them are for her. So thanks for being here, staff. These are the shared agreements we'd like to go over for tonight's meeting. First, please keep yourself on mute until called upon. Second, you can put questions in the chat and staff will be uh, looking at those throughout the meeting and then moderating the Q&A session at the end. Number three, please only one person speaks at a time. Number four, please use respectful language. Number five, please keep your questions to a minute if you are called upon so we can let everyone have a chance to talk. And number six, save your comments for the public hearing. Tonight is an information and learning session and we're helping uh, prepare people for giving their comments to the Planning Commission and ultimately the City Council. Give me just a second while I get my notes up on my other screen. I have so many presentations open, I apologize. There it is. Terry, if I'll just interject really quickly while you're finding that um, those notes and just say, uh, we are asking folks to put their their questions in the chat when we get to the Q&A portion. Um, we do have a few folks joining by phone, and I'll give some instructions once we get to that point. Um, I know you're not able to enter information in the chat through your phone. So just letting everybody know. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, I've got my notes up. Um, so uh, the first part of the presentation is some background on the bill. We'll try to keep it brief, but we want to make sure everyone has the same uh, foundation of information to start from. So the project is House Bill 2001, also known as the Middle Housing Bill, which was passed by the state legislature in 2019. The effect of this bill is that it effectively eliminates single family only zoning in large cities across Oregon. It needs to be implemented by June 30th, 2022. And there are administrative rules and a model code that have been put in place by the state that we'll talk more about later. Next. Thank you. As some of you may know, single family zoning refers to areas of the city that allow only one detached house per plot of land. As University of Oregon Law School professor Sarah Adams Shane and others have documented, single family zoning has exclusionary roots and has created inequities in who has access to large parts of our communities. To move forward, we must first look back and acknowledge that actions in the past have harmed and excluded members of our community. Single family zoning has a complex history that resulted in exclusion of low income, black, indigenous, and other people of color from certain neighborhoods. And in Oregon, this history was especially harmful with direct exclusion of non-white people from the state from 1844 until 1926. Although those exclusions are illegal today, 
their negative impacts are still affecting our community through the legacy of exclusionary zoning. Housing policy and code changes are an opportunity to mitigate those. This is just a picture of our zoning across Eugene. You can see the areas outlined in red on the right are our R1 or low density residential zoned areas, the kind of light yellow. And most of Eugene's neighborhoods have, are dominated by that R1 zoning. Before single family zoning was vastly expanded after World War II, American neighborhoods contained a mix of single houses and other types of housing. Many people are familiar with the term missing middle housing, coined by Daniel Paralek of Opticos Design. Housing that falls between single detached units and an apartment is called missing middle or just middle housing. The House bill defined middle housing to include duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes, cottage clusters, and townhouses. The top three pictures on the slide from left to right are Eugene examples of middle housing, a fourplex, a duplex, and townhome. The middle housing isn't a new concept. It can be found in many older neighborhoods and historic districts, as well as in newer mixed housing neighborhoods. But until House Bill 2001, new middle housing was difficult to build only allowed in certain places, requiring special permits, public hearings, and discretionary approval processes. Once cities implement this bill, middle housing will be allowed by right in most large city neighborhoods. Here are some definitions. A duplex is two units on a lot. A triplex is three. A fourplex is four. A cottage cluster is a grouping of no fewer than four that comes from the rules. Detached dwellings per acre with a footprint of less than 900 square feet. And that includes a common courtyard. Townhouses are two or more attached dwellings where each dwelling is located on an individual lot or parcel and shares at least one common wall with an adjacent dwelling. A little bit about how this project is different than some of our other planning projects. This one is big, it's different, and it's fast. Our usual projects are city council directed, meaning that there is support and direction coming down through our local decision makers who give guidance to the staff. This project is coming from the state and city staff are working to implement it. That dynamic presents a unique challenge. Although the bill was passed in 2019, the project didn't kick off until early 2020, which means that the vast majority of the public engagement and project work has occurred over Zoom. Lastly, two years is really the blink of an eye in planning time. We've had to move quickly while ensuring we do things right, and it's still, we're still in the middle. A little bit about how the administrative rules were created. There was a state-directed process headed by the staff at the Department of Land Conservation and Development. And they, this is typical for when a house bill affecting land use passes the legislature. The staff create a rules advisory committee. In this case, there were 23 members from all around the state and from all different stakeholder groups. There was a technical advisory committee with 25 members. They held nine meetings and ultimately developed minimum standards for cities to comply with and a model code. Those were both adopted by the Land Conservation and Development Commission. And now I'm going to pass it over to Sophie for her portion of the presentation to describe the public involvement and summarize the draft code. Okay. Thank you, Terry. This is just an overview of our public engagement process and there's a lot more information online and um, also if you contact staff, we can definitely elaborate on it. We love talking about engagement. Um, I just wanted to highlight some key components of the engagement. We had stakeholder roundtables, an equity roundtable, a lottery selected panel that was new for our processes. We pulled together local developers for a focus group. We launched a community-wide survey. We partnered with students to do some student outreach. We um, 
increased and sometimes established our presence on social media. And then we had quite a few meetings with the planning commission and city council. So I'll just review these components. However, they're not all encompassing of all the work that was done. So first I wanted to touch on the boards and commissions roundtable. These were the participants on the roundtable. Um, all of these lists of participants tied directly back to the public involvement plan, which was approved by the planning commission and is available on the webpage. They held uh, three meetings together and they came up with guiding values and principles for the project, code recommendations, and then affordability recommendations. Very similarly, this was like the, the sister group to the, the Boards and Commissions Roundtable. We had the Local Partners Roundtable. They also had three meetings on the exact same topics um, and this word cloud and the word cloud on the slide uh, before this one come from their recommendations. Then we had an equity roundtable. This roundtable um, was new to our process. It included um, folks who were representatives from, under, um, from organizations that serve underrepresented communities. They were compensated for their time. This was something that we did differently. They had five meetings with five meeting summaries and recommendations. Um, and we are hopeful that this will lay the groundwork for future, um, future engagement in our community. Then another new thing we did, I touched on this, the lottery selected panel. This was run by Portland nonprofit Healthy Democracy. Um, this uh, panel basically created a microcosm of Eugene in a virtual room by choosing 90 or sorry, 29 uh, panelists. They met 15 times um, and they were also compensated for their time. And this was unique in that the, um, aside from being lottery selected, they spent their first 10 meetings establishing background knowledge that was um, shared among them before moving into their recommendations. I just wanted to touch a bit on the panel demographics. Um, there were eight panelists under the age of 25. We had representation from all city wards, including unincorporated areas. One in six panelists experience a disability and almost half of the panelists rent their homes. It included representation of multiple gender identities. It used local school age demographics from 4J and Bethel, which was more diverse than the general population. And educational attainment ranged from no high school diploma to advanced degrees. The, then there was the community-wide survey. This was launched via our engagement platform, Engage Eugene. Um, however, some uh, some copies were available to be sent out um, printed. Uh, there were 70, 741 responses. 11 of those were to our Spanish survey. And it overwhelmingly encouraged the city to go beyond the minimum standards as established by the state. Then I mentioned that we paired with some students. We paired with a University of Oregon planning public policy and management class called Real World Eugene that pairs students with city staff to work on real projects. The timing worked out really well. They, that group of students led focus groups and also launched a student specific survey that received 137 responses. Then later we had one of those students stay on to intern with us and they created a Gen Z specific GIS story map for the project. I mentioned social media. Our handle is at huge planning um, without a space between it. Sorry for that typo. So we've had a presence on Instagram with 48 middle housing specific posts. Um, even this information session was posted on there. We have our Facebook um, that hosted five Facebook live events about this project that touched on climate equity, transportation, connecting with Gen Z and economics. And then we had a Reddit uh, question and answer forum called an Ask Me Anything in the Eugene subreddit, which is kind of like a channel. And that had over a hundred engagements. And this is just a giant summary that you couldn't possibly consume in one Zoom meeting. It's on the webpage and we're happy to send it out after. This just reflects the, um, the summary of all of the engagement that we've done.
And as Terry mentioned, all of this happened over Zoom because there's been a pandemic. So uh, we do acknowledge that we did miss out on some folks by not being able to have in-person meetings. And we really tried to reach a, um, a group of people that were representative of the community that we are serving. So now um, I'll go into um, a little bit of an overview of what the code includes. And I will say that um, this is a summary and that there is uh, more inclusive information, more accurate information on our webpage and our proposed code. We're also going to be releasing a summary that I'll talk about later. Um, that is also a summary and not all inclusive. And so please, um, you know, if you want specifics in the code, look at the actual code document. It's impossible to summarize. Um, believe us, we have tried. So the way that we structured the, um, the choices that we had with complying with House Bill 2001 were into what we call allow, encourage, and incentivize. So allow would be us just meeting the minimum standards established by the Department of Land Conservation and Development and the Land Conservation and Development Commission. So um, following the rules that they set out. Encourage would be going beyond the rules to remove barriers to middle housing, to make it even easier to develop that middle housing. And then incentivize would be doing even more to remove barriers and lower the cost of middle housing. So it had that affordability lens built into it. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So we asked all of our outreach groups, should we allow, encourage, or incentivize? And overall, we, um, we had a consensus that we should go beyond the minimum standards and we should encourage and incentivize. Um, this graph below is from the survey and it shows that 82% of survey respondents wanted us to go beyond the minimum standards. So that made it easy to form recommendations um, since we heard that general consensus. So with that, I wanted to have some highlights of the proposed code. The first is that the proposed code um, allows plexes, so duplexes, triplexes, and fourplexes to be detached as well as attached. And so we just define duplex as two units on a lot, no matter how those units look. Um, same with triplexes and fourplexes. So this is new, um, however, this was an option that was included in the minimum standards uh, for House Bill 2001. And this graph, I think this graphic is a little hard to tell, but the one on the right is a detached duplex. And then I wanted to highlight lot size. And so um, the left column points out the housing type. Um, I will, I did wanna point out that this graphic and a lot of our materials use the words single detached dwelling. And that refers to what is commonly referred to as single family dwellings. However, state law required that we remove the word family from our zoning code, zoning and development codes. And so we're phasing out of that. So single detached dwelling is what we refer to now. The middle column is what the code proposes for the minimum lot size. And the far right column is the proposed minimum lot size if units are under 900 square feet. So this is something that we heard um, both in our outreach and in our communications to planning commission is that um, they wanted to incentivize smaller units. And this was a way that we were hoping to do that. So single detached dwellings uh, minimum lot size currently is 4,500 square feet. And we're not proposing to alter that at all. So there's no, there's no adjustment um, if the units are smaller. With duplex, it's 2,250 square feet. Triplex is 3,500 square feet. Fourplex is 4,500 square feet. Townhouses don't have a minimum lot size because other standards end up affecting that. And cottage clusters are 4,500 square feet. And then all of the numbers in the far right column are a 25% reduction in that minimum lot size. Then we have the building height. Um, so currently the proposed maximum height for single detached dwellings is 30 feet. And the proposed code um, proposes increasing that minimum height by five feet for duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes, and townhouses. 
The only one that's shorter is cottage clusters because those are limited in their size due to the state law. Then there's parking. So this one is a little more nuanced. Um, so, and I have it split into two slides. So single detached dwellings currently allow one space per unit. And then we have this far right column that's proposed minimum off street parking if the, if the housing is located near transit and or has small units. And so when we say near transit, we mean within a fourth of a mile of transit, frequent transit routes, or if they and or if they are less than 900 square feet. So um, a variety of things could inc could induce this um, this incentive. So for duplexes, we have we've proposed one space per dwelling unit. If it's not <laughs> near transit and if the units are over 900 square feet, but if they are, we propose no parking. And I'll just make it easy on myself. If if middle housing developments meet the um, meet the far right columns, locational factors or size factors, then they just don't need to require parking in the proposed code. Triplexes, the amount of um, off street parking correlates to the lot size. And so the larger the lot size, the more parking. And this ties directly to the minimum standards. They're written um, in a similar way. And so um, the maximum number of off street parking spots that you would have to provide for a triplex is three. The same goes for fourplex. It's also correlated with lot size and the maximum that you would have to provide is four. Then townhouse, we go back down to one space per dwelling unit and cottage cluster one space per dwelling unit. So I mentioned that we were going to have a code summary table come up, um, come out tomorrow. And so that will be a thing. Um, this is an example of how to read it. So the way that we've structured it is that we will have each standard in the code or not every single one of them, because as we said, you can never summarize it all, but as many as we thought made sense, we'll have the minimum standard to the left, um, and I don't know if you can see my mouse if I hover here, um, and that is comes directly from the Oregon administrative rules from the state. Then we have the model code standard, and so all model code standards meet the minimum standards. However, in some cases, they exceed them. Then we have our proposed standard in the R1 zone um, because that's the most effective zone by uh, this legislation. And we have whether that standard allow, encourages, or incentivizes. And so in this case, we have a split between encourage and incentivize. And that's because um, the minimum lot size is less than single detached dwellings. However, it could be further reduced if it's near transit or it has small units. And so it could either be encourage or incentivize depending on the scenario. So that will come tomorrow, October 20th, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but that's how to read through our summary tables. Then I will hand it over to Jeff to talk about middle housing land divisions. Thanks, Sophie. Um, so this was a separate house bill that passed earlier this year. It was called Senate Bill uh, four, uh, geez, 458. Um, I don't know how many times I've said that and I can't get it right tonight, but so we call it middle housing land divisions because it's a much more understandable term. And essentially what this was is it was an initiative brought forward through the Senate bill that said uh, we need not only to allow the opportunity to build more middle housing, but we also need to promote home ownership within those new middle housing developments. So traditionally, you know, when you built a duplex, you know, that duplex could have one owner unless you went through the condominiumization process, which is a really expensive process for anybody who's gone through it. And so this ability allows you to go through an expedited land division process to essentially draw lines, draw property lines around each individual unit or, or around just kind of segregate the lot in such a way that people could own each individual one. And some of the really basic rules of that land division are things like um, each, middle housing lot that you're creating can only have one dwelling unit on it. Um, 
Each lot or unit has to have separate utilities. You have to have necessary easements like for pedestrian access, common areas, driveways, parking, things like that to make sure that you can move around the property. Um, all buildings have to meet the building code. And then you have to meet the development code for the parent lot. So I'll talk about it a little more on the next slide, but I just pulled a few examples of, because we are proposing this to allow people who have currently built middle housing that, that exists right now. So these two pictures are from Eugene. Um, and I, I pulled one picture of a duplex, so that's the one on the left. And you can see that in, you could kind of draw a box around one part of that duplex and sell that portion off. And that person could own that part of their home. And then on the right, you'll see an uh, example of the cottage cluster where the cottages each are able to be owned separately and then the lot as a whole will be owned by that group of people. So looking at a different example, so if you feel go to the next slide, So here's an example of a middle housing land division that let's say hasn't happened yet. So you have an existing lot and that existing lot, just to make it really clear, because this is something that's been really confusing for everybody, that existing lot, what we're calling the parent lot, um, that has to meet all of our normal standards. So if you're gonna put a fourplex on it, according to our code, you have to have, 4,500 square feet of area. You have to meet our frontage standards. You have to meet the street improvement standards. You have to do all that for the parent lot. And then if, when you go to actually draw what you see here are the pink lines and draw property ownership boundaries so that you're dividing it up for home ownership reasons, those individual lots don't have to meet things like minimum lot size. They don't have to meet frontage requirements or width requirements because you're literally just drawing a box around the unit or a part of the yard so that that person can own that area and get into home ownership. So that's one thing I want to make really clear is that the parent lot still has to meet all of our normal development standards. You're not allowed to just create a lot without any development standards. Um, so I'm happy to answer more questions about the middle housing land divisions process. I know it's a pretty nuanced piece, but uh, so if you, if you want to go to the next slide, another thing that you'll see on our website is a middle housing lot size map. And so staff has produced this uh, as a way to kind of illustrate the current code proposal and residential lots around the city. And so as Sophie mentioned earlier, we allowed du the proposal is for duplexes to be allowed on lots that are 2,250 square feet. Um, triplexes on 3,500 square feet, and then tri quadplexes, cottage clusters on lots greater than 4,500. And so you can see on this map, it kind of illustrates by lot size where uh, quadplexes could be allowed. And just as a note, the map doesn't take into account if these lots are developed or not. It's just to illustrate kind of the size, the general size of lots around the city for residential. Perfect, and I will hand it off. I think this is me. Um, thank you, Jeff. Um, so we've heard a lot of questions about what the city can do to encourage affordability within um, middle housing developments. And we just wanted to make it really clear that the city cannot require that new middle housing be affordable to, to people in certain income ranges. And that's because right now the city doesn't require that single detached dwellings be affordable to people in certain incomes. So we basically have to treat middle housing the exact same way. But we, all of our public outreach um, unanimously encouraged the city to focus on affordability. So what we did do was focus on affordability market rate affordability um, as much as we could. So we wanted to clarify that the city can allow for middle housing on smaller lots to allow more units on each lot to reduce land cost per unit. We can encourage smaller middle housing units by reducing lot sizes and eliminating off-street parking when units are under 900 square feet in size. We can offer a density bonus if property owners commit to keeping some units affordable to people earning lower incomes. 
This density bonus is not yet written in the code, but it is something that we heard about, just flagging that that language doesn't exist yet. And another thing that doesn't exist yet is that we can reduce city fees, property taxes, and or public facilities costs for middle housing affordable to people with lower incomes. So those are things that we're exploring. They're things that we heard. Those first two are in the proposed code and the second two are things that we are working on. I also wanted to promote our middle housing webpage. It's eugene-or.gov slash middle housing, all one word. Um, it has a ton of information sheets, consultant products, videos, photos, maps. If you scroll to the bottom, there are links to all of to recordings of all of our past meetings as well as upcoming meetings. So lots to explore there. You'll see here on this screenshot that you can sign up for formal notice. That button also leads you to a list where you can sign up for informal notice if you want to just receive emails from us. Um, but if you do want to receive mailed notice, there's a button there. There's also a button to our Middle Housing Engage Eugene page. And while that's not as active as it was when we were actively soliciting feedback earlier in the engagement process, it still includes some blog posts and um, upcoming events that mirror those on the middle housing web page. So what now? Our next thing that we are preparing for is our Planning Commission public hearing happening the evening of November 16th, 2021. So save the date, mark your calendars. It will be happening on Zoom. Then we're hoping to receive a recommendation, or we're hoping that the Planning Commission makes their recommendation to City Council by the end of the calendar year in December. And in early 2022, the City Council will begin their public hearings process. We don't yet have a date for that, but it will happen in early 2022. And we're hoping to receive action from them prior to June 30th, 2022, because that's when the model code would kick in. They can wait until after that if they would like. But the model code would, um, would apply to any unadopted sections in the meantime. And that's a new thing that came down from the state that's a little different than other processes. And we still want to hear from you. So there's a variety of ways to provide your input. Um, we created, oh, I'm so sorry. There's a typo here. I will fix that um, and put a new link in the chat. You can email middle housing testimony, all one word, at eugene-or.gov. Um, that's been active. It's seeing a lot of activity. And so um, anything that you email there will be put in the public record um, for the middle housing project and planning commission and city council will see it. You can also email the planning commission. So if you email planning commissioners at eugene-or.gov, that will immediately go to all of the planning commissioners at the same time. And then if you want to email the mayor and the city council all at the same time, you can email mayor, mayor, city, and city, mayor, council, and city manager at eugene-or.gov. Although they're shortcuts, they're not very easy to say. You can also provide public testimony by speaking at planning commission and speaking at city council. And we have that outlined, how to speak at city council and email folks in our upcoming Middle Housing Guide to the Adoption process that includes all of the spiffy summary tables I discussed that will be released tomorrow. I will post it on the project webpage tomorrow. I'll also be sending it out to the project email list. So if you would like to sign up for that project email list, you can either do so on the um, by clicking the button that's on the Middle Housing webpage or you can go to this tiny URL, tinyurl.com slash MH emails. That'll take you to the sign up page. You can also email me if you have any questions or would like me to send you the guide, or if you drop your email in the chat, I can make a note to send you the guide tomorrow as well. It'll have all the things in it. And now we will open it up for questions. Thank you everybody for listening and I'm excited to hear what questions you have for us. I think Jeff, are you moderating the questions? Yeah, I'm going to go awesome. through the questions and uh, kind of read those out and hand them off to whoever's appropriate. One thing that I do want to say is that I, I did see that there was somebody joining us by phone. 
Um, if you want to read out your question or ask a question live, you can dial star nine, which will raise your hand and that'll let us know you're looking to ask that question. Um, otherwise, I'm going to dive right into it, um, kind of working up at the where some of the first questions came in. First one would be actually, I can answer this one pretty easily. It says, does the middle housing land division apply to ADUs? Uh, no, the middle housing land division does not apply to ADUs. The Senate bill specifically states that it applies for middle housing development. So, and just as a reminder to everybody, House Bill 2001 is about middle housing and it's not about accessory dwelling units. We just kind of uh, went through that process as many of you probably know. Um, the next question, uh, Sophie, I'll hand this one off to you. It's, can you explain minimum parking requirements? As I understand them, this means a new home could build new parking, but would not be required to build new parking by our land use code. Is that accurate? Yes, that's accurate. Um, so if, if we don't have, if we don't require any on-site parking, that does not prohibit developers from building any minimum or any parking at all, they can build as much as they would like. Same with the minimum parking standards, even if we require just one parking space per dwelling, they could build more than that. Um, we actually invited a Minneapolis planning commissioner to come to one of our staff meetings. Um, the city of Minneapolis also eliminated single family only zoning before Oregon did. And then um, fairly recently, they also eliminated minimum parking. And we asked, have people, you know, are people not building parking? And he said that people are still building parking. I know that's anecdotal, but that is something we see that um, basically when you don't require parking, you just let the market regulate it and you still do see parking come from developments. Great, thanks, Sophie. All right, let's see what I have next. So there's a question about the map that had the, the lot size map, and it says, does it consider lots that are covered by CCNRs? Uh, does it take them out of the equation for middle housing? And just to put a little context behind this question, because I'll take this one, is that uh, the House bill did take into consideration that if there were CCNRs that existed prior to the adoption of the House bill that prohibited middle housing, that these rules uh, that you wouldn't, those would, the CCNRs would essentially cover that situation. So if your CCNR said there shall not be a duplex on this lot, that would uh, supersede the house bill. So the fact of the matter is that no, the lot size map does not take into account the lots that have existing CCNRs on them. There's no existing database that we are aware of here at the city of all of the CNRs throughout the history of Eugene. Um, CCNR is just for everybody's benefit. It's, uh, oh, geez, covenants. Uh, boy, that's sure is 7.30 at night. Um, I'll get back to you on that, put it in the chat. So that's CCNRs. They are not taken into consideration that map. Um, I have a couple questions about uh, street parking. So let's see here. Is there a minimum street width to accommodate for parking? So essentially the question is trying to ask that um, in those cases where you, know, you don't have any required parking on the site in the lot, is there a street width minimum to develop middle housing? The answer is no. Um, the only case in which middle, the street width comes into play is in the event of a land use application. That's not necessarily going to happen in every scenario. And I believe there's another question in the chat that actually kind of got to this point as well. It asked, uh, my street width is only 18 feet wide. Um, can I still develop middle housing on that lot? So if you're annexed into the city and you meet all of the other development standards, you could develop your lot on that 18 foot wide street. That said, there are things called special setbacks. So however wide the street is supposed to be, you have to set your house back according to that measurement and then your, your normal front yard setbacks start from there. And so that's something that uh, the land use code currently does and takes into account when streets are substandard. It requires those special setbacks. Uh, hey Jeff, 
I see yeah. Terry's hand went up. Yeah, I just Terry, wanted to see if my raised hand feature was working and it is, but, but no, I want to answer a question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go for it. So, so I'll lower my hand here. And um, the question I wanted to take is from Cassia, and it says, is it wise to proceed with approval for development before we have secured clear guidelines for affordable housing? Um, and then a comment about that. And I wanted to reemphasize the point about affordable housing. Um, our code can do things to try to encourage more affordable middle housing, but we can't in fact require it because that is not a requirement that is placed on single family development, single detached development. And the main overarching goal of House Bill 2001 is to level the playing field between single detached dwellings and middle housing. The other thing I would say about this is it's a comment. We welcome comments. And I would encourage you to send these comments to the Planning Commission and the City Council at the email address that we've included in our presentation. Oh. Um, so I just wanted to remind you that too, where there are comments in the chat, we'll encourage you to submit those into the record. Thanks, Terry. That's the next one I had on my list. Um, all right, let's take a look at this one. It says on lots less than 6,000 square feet, what's the maximum lot coverage allowed? Uh, I'm gonna say for middle housing, and what are the setbacks, also max height? So, Sophie, do you want to take a first, first shot at that one? Yes. So we actually have a handy graphic illustrating this that I can pull up, made by Jennifer Knapp. Um, Jen, did you want to pop on and maybe talk about that? I can share it. Um, we have so many staff here tonight. Yeah. It's great. <laughs> Sure, I can talk through what's illustrated here in the rendering. Also, just a quick shout out to Tim Morris, who put CCNRs in the chat for me. It's covenants, conditions, and restrictions. I'm sorry, this is taking me so long, Jen. I'm looking for keywords in my email. Um, really quick, while she's looking up that answer, I'll take um, a chance to answer a question from Pam Waddell, which is, is it true that the tree preservation rules have been waived for middle housing? Um, that's not necessarily a true statement. The tree preservation standards that are being applied to middle housing are those that also apply to a single family home. And so on lots less than 20,000 square feet, you have the ability to take down trees on your lot, lots greater than that, additional rules apply. That said, there are also tree preservation standards that exist in chapter six of the Eugene uh, code. So, and those standards still apply. So um, the same tree preservation standards that apply to a single family home are being applied to middle housing. And it looks like Sophie got that graphic up. Okay, so what's illustrated here is the maximum build out of that is existing in the current code and then that is proposed in the middle housing code. So A illustrates the maximum build out allowed for a single family dwelling. So that's a, and these are all on a standardized lot of about 60 by 120, which is a really common lot size in Eugene. So that would allow for a 3,600 square foot footprint. It can go up to 37 feet in height and it's allowed a 50% coverage. Um, example B is the maximum build out for attached plex without parking. And so that is the setbacks are 27% of the property and that utilizes a 75% coverage. And so that's an approximate um, 5,250 square foot footprint. It could go up to 42 feet in height. And um, then example C shows a single, kind of an average single family dwelling. So that its footprint is approximately 1,830 square feet. Um, it's 29 feet in height. It has 30% lot coverage in a detached garage. So this 
is a common scenario that we see in Eugene. And then maximum build out for a quadplex that does have required parking would be 2,190 square feet and approximately 30% lot coverage. And if you can scroll down, so you can show the backyards as well. So this is the back. So you can see parking really um, dramatically reduces the um, footprint of um, a potential quadplex. So this B is a, um, just to be clear, B is a quadplex and D is also a quadplex because that would be the biggest building and most coverage. If you have questions, you can, um, any more questions, you can drop them in the chat. Thanks, Jen. And that graphic is going to be in the guide to the adoption process and will be, I think it's already on the webpage. Great, thanks. Um, I just, uh, there's somebody who asked for a clarification around CCNRs. Um, and I said, they asked if it's, this is a true statement and it says that the current standing of CCNRs are not required to adhere to House Bill 2001. So CCNRs in place before, House Bill 2001 was adopted. Stand, if you were to go record new CCNRs to try to subvert the rules that came out of the House Bill, um, those would not be, you'd not be able to apply those. Um, you could record a document like that, but it wouldn't be applicable. So just to clarify that, the new CCNRs cannot prohibit middle housing that is required through the House Bill. Um, Jeff, um, real quick, I think that might have been in private message to you. I don't see it in the main chat. It was, yeah. I just thought I just had that clarification just to make sure okay. that everybody had a clear understanding of that. Thank you. Would you mind answering some of the questions about public work standards and other standards? Because there's a couple related questions about geotech standards and are sidewalks required? So kind of like what are the other standards that apply and how are public yeah. improvements? Um, Absolutely. So those standards, the geotech standards still apply the way that they do currently. Um, in cases of when there's a land use application, like uh, there's something called needed housing. I don't need to go down that rabbit hole right now, but there are different standards that apply to housing versus um, other situations and other types of developments. So those geotechnical standards would apply, but regardless, the geotechnical standards do apply to middle housing. And then the question of are sidewalks required? Sidewalks are required in the same way that they'd be required currently. So there are instances in which a new development would not trigger sidewalk requirements. And there are instances when they will trigger sidewalk requirements, depending on the development on the street and some other factors. And that's those are policies and standards that are put in place through our building permit services department. Um, so we did not, there's no exemptions or anything like that that have been granted for sidewalks. Um, let's see, that's geotech and consumer sidewalks. I have one here. So why, so Bill Asperger asks, why are developers allowed to use on-street parking credits in neighborhoods with permit parking? That's like a residential permit parking program for on-street parking. These areas already have parking problems. This allowance will only make it worse. So Sophie or Terry, do one of you want to take that? I think my first answer would be we need to offer the same regulations for middle housing as we do for single housing. That's the first thing. And the second thing is that this is a comment. It's a fair comment. And you should you should definitely include that in your comments to the decision makers, Bill. Um, Anything to add, Sophie, in terms of how this relates to the rules that we're interpreting for parking? The rules don't specifically call out um, permitted parking areas. However, they do specifically call out um, being able to use on-street credits. So I don't think I have further comments. Yeah, parking was definitely a big issue as we worked our way through the different parts of the code discussion with the Planning Commission. And so um, these things were asked and discussed. Um, currently, it's the Planning Commission's recommendation to staff, and that's what we've rec recommended and included in our draft code to treat those areas the same. 
but it's not the only outcome and that's why we're having the public hearing is to hear what people think. Great, thanks. Um, and then I'll follow up with this question from Rini Kane that says, she's thanking Jen for her graphic and she's asking that, what are the model code provisions for that same development that would apply, i.e. setbacks and lot coverage? Sophie, you wanna take that one? Yeah, so I'll talk specifically about the model code standards for fourplexes, since those um, two examples of fourplexes were shown. And sorry, I'm looking off to the side. I'm looking at a document with this information on it. Um, so first of all, um, the model code would allow a fourplex to be built on, um, on that 60 by 120 lot um, because it would have the same minimum lot size that applies to single detached dwellings in the same zone. Um, the I believe that the minimum frontage would also work because um, the model code uses the same frontage as a single detached dwelling. Um, the front yard setbacks cannot be greater than 10 feet except for those setbacks applicable to garages and carports. So I still believe that graphic would be accurate. Um, the minimum parking, um, there would be one off-street parking space per development. Um, and so there would be less parking than the full parking build out, however, more parking than the, um, than the fourplex with no parking. And then um, in the model code, maximum lot coverage does not apply to triplexes and fourplexes. And so I believe that the parking would be the only change. Um, and again, uh, the minimum standards and the model codes and the proposed code will all be available tomorrow in a summary. Um, the minimum standards are um, even further different than the model code. Um, so happy to explain that more. Good question. Thanks, Sophie. Um, I'm going to jump to back to a question that Tom Bruno asked a little while ago that I overlooked. It says, if a PUD being processed, such as Capitol Hill or University Heights, water pumping stations were sized appropriately for fire suppression, this can now go up to 132 units, question mark. Uh, so that's a very specific question of a very specific planned unit development that was approved a few years ago. So Planned unit developments, just for everybody's benefit, is a very long and engaged land use process. And during that process, things are evaluated for things like safety or water pumping, such as this question, or street access, street connectivity. Because each planned unit development is so different, there's no way for us to answer whether or not the house bill would necessarily trigger a required modification of the planned unit development. So essentially, if for example, with Capitol Hill, it would be likely that it would require somebody to go in and go through another land use application to say, um, do the analysis to prove that the additional units aren't gonna have a negative impact. Is that the case for every single land use application that's been approved? We don't know, we haven't looked at them all. And with the Capitol Hill example, I mean, that's my best estimate on my knowledge of that process. And I don't actually know that much about Capitol Hill itself. So. Um, my answer really related to plan existing and approved land use approvals like a planned unit development is that it's going to have to happen on a case by case analysis on whether or not you'd be able to develop middle housing. So I'm going to jump from there to the uh, Bill Aspergen has a question about zero off-street parking spaces are required within a quarter mile of frequent transit lines. This will include some of the most heavily parked areas of the city, for example, around the University of Oregon, West University, South University, and Fairmount. Please explain the analysis that was done to justify this. Terry, do you wanna take the frequent transit corridors question? Sure. So going back to our Envision Eugene process and community vision, uh, that was approved by the council in 2012, and one of the main tenets of Envision Eugene is to add compact development along our key transportation corridors and in core commercial areas. So one of the things we've been doing is 
incentivizing multifamily development along those corridors by, for example, offering reductions in system development charges. So that's an existing incentive that's tied to that geography of a quarter mile around frequent transit lines. So the theory is the same, or the premise is the same, that a community that is connected by frequent transit um, provides more places for housing opportunities to be located close to services and ways for people to get around. Over time, that aligns with our climate goals of reducing vehicle miles traveled and single occupant vehicles. Um, and again, with the comments, they're fair. There are a lot of questions about this, and it's something that's definitely still on the table and that the Planning Commission and Council will want to hear from folks about to make sure that we get it right. Thanks, Terry. Um, so there's another question here for homes that currently have solar panels, where there be any protections essentially to stop those from being shaded or will there be, this next question says panels on new builds. I'm, I think that probably means like, will new builds be required to have solar panels? And the answer to the first question is the city has solar setback requirements as well as solar lot standards. So to mitigate those impacts of um, shading and shadows created by new developments, we do have those standards. There are exceptions to those standards based on lot size, dimension, location, things like that. So it's a case by case analysis. But because those solar lot standards apply to single family homes, they also apply to middle housing development. So, uh, and then there are no, through these land use code changes, there's no requirements for someone to put solar panels on their new building. So that's not a requirement that's being placed on middle housing developments. All right, and then I'll skip down here to Cassia Delabaugh who asked, has there been any consideration for identifying neighborhoods focused on community and single home ownership with more green space on the lot versus developing multi units on the same size? Reducing green space and creating more units per lot size cluster in similar areas. I guess it's more of a statement than a question, but I guess the what I'll put out there is has there been any consideration for different neighborhoods receiving different standards for middle housing? Sophie, do you want to take that one? Yes. Um, for green space, um, I'm trying to think of how to word this. I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't have said yes. Um, I, I, I can take it if you're not. Okay. I, yeah, I didn't want to put you on the back foot there. Um, so. As of right now, the current proposal put forth by the Planning Commission or supported by the Planning Commission is that we are treating all neighborhoods throughout Eugene the same for middle housing. So those areas and neighborhoods that have special area zones, for example, the current plan is for those to point back to the middle housing standards that apply everywhere else. So there's no special consideration being given to neighborhoods based on their um, green space or particular neighborhood character, things like that. The current proposal is for the middle housing to apply citywide. Um, so hopefully that's clear if Terry or Sophie want to follow yeah. up at all. Well, I would just add one thing and that is that again, there has been a discussion about the right balance between open space and space for buildings um, and the current code tilts toward allowing more housing. Um, but this is a policy choice, ultimately, that as long as Eugene complies with the minimum standards, this is a policy choice for us to go beyond that and provide more housing and encourage more housing. Um, so again, lots of opinions. They're all good. We want you to submit them. Thanks, Terry. Um, there's a question here that says, what have you recommended about uh, electric vehicle chargers? And at this point, the middle housing land use code doesn't have anything about electric vehicle chargers um, in the proposal. It's not something that was discussed by the state. It's not something that we require of single family homes. Um, I will so add, oh, sorry to cut you off, Jeff. No, um, fine. 
I will add to that that there is another rulemaking process separate from the House Bill 2001 rulemaking process going on at the state, also being overseen by the Department of Land Conservation and Development. It's the Climate Friendly and Equitable Cities rulemaking. And one of the things, one of the topics that they are exploring is making rules about electric vehicle chargers. And so that is something going on. Um, I can post a link in the chat um, if you would like to learn more about that. But as Jeff said, it's separate from this process, but it is coming. Thanks for that, Sophie. Yeah, I think that's some other uh, state planning that's really important to keep an eye on. Let's see here. Um, Pam Woodell expressed some concerns around affordable housing and the uh, need or concerns around the removal or not providing enough affordable housing. Terry, do you want to talk a little bit about affordable housing? Sure. I'm just reading Pam's questions. Has anything been done to prevent a net loss of currently affordable housing? So this is a good question that we've heard a lot. and one thing we've done to try to answer some of the frequently asked questions about affordability is prepare a two-page FAQ. And I, we could probably put a link to it in the chat, but in general, the most frequently asked question about affordability is, can we require new housing to be affordable? And the answer to that is not really. We can't uh, put a requirement in our code that says new middle housing has to be affordable. And that's mostly because we don't have that requirement for single family homes. However, there are other things we can do within the code and we showed them on one of our slides. They include minimizing lot sizes, um, reducing parking requirements, uh, considering a density bonus and considering reduction of fees. The other things we can do are outside the code. Well, fees are outside the code, but in terms of our related question in the chat about displacement and gentrification, these are also big concerns that affect the entire city and that are not unique to middle housing. So those are important. They've been discussed by the city council very recently in their work session on the housing implementation pipeline. So I also wanted to let folks know that while the first goal of this project is implementing the requirements of the house bill, that's not all we're doing. And it's not all the city is doing in terms of addressing citywide housing issues. Thanks, Terry. And then I appreciate Sophie just put a link to our affordability FAQ in Thank the you, chat. Sophie. And there are some additional questions from Karen. Uh, Newton, who said um, related to affordability, and the questions are who in our community can currently afford housing, and what has our economic analysis shown, i.e., you know, how will, how will this help the affordability of new housing supply? And where, where do economists expect this to, the middle housing co changes to steer supply? So, do you have comments on that as well, or do you want to point people towards the affordability FAQ? Well, um, I would add to my previous answer by saying that we know we have a big issue with the housing crisis in our community and across Lane County, and that a lot of our data comes from the recently adopted Lane County Affordable Housing Action Plan. There are some really great um, charts that show kind of the distribution of incomes and what people earning different incomes can afford in our community. Um, so I can't spout them off the top of my head, but we do have that information and we know that there is a need across the income spectrum, mostly at the, the lower income ranges. And Karen's second question, has, what has the economic analysis shown, Re, how this will help the affordability of new housing supply? Um, the analysis we asked our consultants at Equa Northwest to do, and this is on our website as well, is shows that adopting a encourage to incentivize approach in our code will do the most possible to 
provide housing affordable to folks earning moderate incomes. And so that can help with people trying to purchase a home or people trying to afford a rental. And generally the income ranges that this will help is estimated to be the 80 to 120% of area median income. I would love for somebody to put a chat uh, link to the Lane County Affordable Action, Affordable Housing Action Plan. Maybe Sophie can find that in a minute. And Sophie also threw in our Eco Northwest memo on the impacts from the different code scenarios. So that's also in the chat for everybody's benefit. Let's see here. Um, he even, he even set this up for me. Getting back to parking not being required with these new dwellings, since there will likely be one to two cars per dwelling, how is this not a major issue? Um, so first and foremost, I'll say that parking is required for middle housing developments, unless you meet the parking incentives or you are within one of the frequent transit area corridors. So part, middle housing is not exempt from parking regulations. Sophie um, explained in her, her presentation earlier, as well as um, in our model code, you'll see that for example, cottage clusters, townhomes, they both require one. And then based on lot size, triplexes, quadplexes, they require a, a step increase of parking. Um, and so based on that, we the current proposal is that parking, zero parking requirements are only in those specific areas where you're near transit or you're producing um, lots of a certain size that you aren't required to do parking. And at this time, it's assumed that those, whether if you're near transit, you may not need a car or be required to have a car, you will have on-street parking availability to you and there are other transportation options out there. Um, and Sophie, Terry, do either you want to add on to that? I think you've covered it. Cool. Um, we have a couple questions about um, housing. Well, a question from Tim Morris and then one lower mm -hmm. from Ryan Moore that both talk about our current zoning map, how it relates to BIPOC communities and low income folks, um, and kind of the history of, of zoning and exclusion. Sophie, do you want to take a stab at one of these questions? Yes, we provided a brief overview um, about the history of um, zoning and exclusion. And I think that there, I, I, I'm gonna take this time to just point to some resources um, coming from people with more expertise than myself um, and from um, several documents that we've already produced. So um, I will point to some things that are on the webpage. We have a fact sheets about the history of residential zoning. Um, we also have a, uh, we did a Facebook live about equity and zoning and the history of zoning. We can put links to all of these things in the chat. They're all on the website. Um, also on the website is a section, um, I'll just share my screen here. Um, is a section about the complicated history of residential zoning. And so um, it has some background. It links to a couple of videos. One is a segregated by design video. Um, this one's the longer one, it's about 18 minutes. Then there's a shorter one that I think is about three minutes. The Planning Commission also invited um, the University of Oregon law professor and rules advisory committee member, Professor Sarah Adam Shane to give um, a work session presentation on the relationship um, of zoning and race and zoning and exclusion. And so that's linked here. And then there are also some resources to learn more, um, including a paper written by Dr. Sarah Adam Shane about dismantling segregationist land use controls. So the short answer is that yes, um, zoning, residential zoning does have um, a history of being exclusive and that's been a focal point of both of our public engagement process and the way that we've chosen to talk about uh, this work. Terry, did you have anything to add? Well, 
That was a great summary. Thank you for all those resources. I would just add to Tim's last question, which is what sort of outrage and what sort of feedback have you gotten about this process from renters? Um, just a, a reminder that when we started the project, we took a public involvement plan to the Planning Commission, asked for their feedback on it. It was intentionally focused on an equitable and inclusive approach to setting up um, opportunities for underrepresented communities to engage in the process. So Sophie talked about the Healthy Democracy Panel, the Equity Roundtable, and those are two of the new things that we tried for this project in addition to all of the things that we usually do. I'll the add to that. that. Sorry, <laughs> just one more thing. The feedback that we got from those groups was remarkably aligned from the overall feedback we got from the general community survey. And it was summarized by saying that we should do whatever we can to encourage and incentivize middle housing and also to encourage and incentivize affordability. And we, we've talked about that a lot. We can always do more, but that was definitely a concern of all of the groups, including renters. We had a lot of participation from renters. Yes, I wanted to note um, some of the uh, data we have around renter engagement. And so um, with the survey, we did have 38% uh, of survey respondents indicate that they rent the residence in which they live. 2% um, did not own or rent but are sheltered and 0.1% do not own or rent and are unsheltered. Um, that question was optional. And so it's not um, all inclusive of all respondents. Um, we also had the Healthy Democracy Roundtable, which was about half renters. Um, some of that data was a little bit skewed because we had um, younger folks on the panel. And so if they like say live at home, um, you know, they wouldn't be renting their uh, residence. We had the student engagement and the vast majority of students are renters. Um, and so that's, those are the 137 surveys. And then we had um, some renter um, representation on the equity roundtable. So uh, we definitely did uh, try to hear from more renters than we usually hear from and um, saw some success with that. Great, thanks. Um, so I'm gonna just jump over to Tom Bruno's question, which says, based on my comments on PUDs, um, if places start tearing down and building triplexes, is there an analysis being applied to infrastructure, water, electricity, or gas um, to ensure that the city's in infrastructure doesn't need to be expanded? So I'm going to answer the first part of that question, which is around PUDs. And once again, if somebody comes in and applies for a building permit to expand a single family dwelling into a triplex, or otherwise, it will be during that process, we do analyze whether or not there's an existing land use approval on the site and whether it's consistent with that land use approval. So that'll be done on a case by case of analysis. Terry, do you want to talk a little bit about infrastructure and how the House bill deals with infrastructure from a citywide perspective? Or I can. Um, on. Yeah, there is a part of the House bill that covers cities that have infrastructure constraints, a whole separate process, which Eugene does not fall under. I don't know if you were referring to that, Jeff, or something else. Yeah, and just that the our public works engineering team is part of our conversation and our wider middle housing team. So they are engaged in this process and providing comments on whether or not they anticipate any issues as a, as a problem relating to the middle housing code amendment. So. It's something that's on our radar and that we are watching very closely. Um, the House bill did have some explicit stuff about infrastructure analyses in there. So I'll just kind of leave it there probably. Yeah, um, one other item that we're coordinating with our public work staff on is access management standards. So like where driveways can be located and how close they can be to an intersection. There's a lot of um, issues that become tricky to implement at the local level when they're written at the state wide level, which is one of the reasons why um, we've proposed our own code rather than using the model code, which is, which is written in a very general manner. Um, yeah. I wanted to take another one on here, Jeff, that 
asks about whether staff have reviewed an outside website. Thanks. So I wanted to touch on that one because there are a couple things that we can do. Staff are available to help neighborhood associations with their newsletters and review articles. And I know several people, maybe on this call, have taken advantage of that. So thank you. Um, city sponsored neighborhood associations are critical in helping us get the word out about our projects. And so that is something that you can take advantage of. Um, we have not reviewed outside websites and that's not part of our role. What we do try to do is make sure that our own website is fact checked and reviewed by our legal staff. And so you can trust the information that we have on there. Anything to add, Jeff? No, I think that's, that's good there. I don't think I missed any other questions. There's anyone who would like to unmute and ask a question. Um, I know you've heard a lot of city staff's voices tonight. Um, so just wanted to welcome that opportunity. But it's also late and we might not wanna talk land use until 8.30. Uh, Karin, I see your hand is up. Hi, everybody. Um, and thanks, uh, Sophie and Terry, for the presentation of all of this work. Um, I was just reading through the chat in the comments, and one thought was that, um, well, of course, it's not your purview to <laughs> spend time um, just sort of reviewing uh, websites generated by people in the community. It does make me think that uh, people who are participating in this meeting would appreciate having some access to a summary of facts about our current housing needs and how this work is um, related to that. You know, it's a lot of complex material, but the underlying need uh, is, is overwhelming and the opportunities that we have to work on it are many. So this is one piece of the puzzle, but um, I would just encourage you all to consider uh, that kind of uh, fact sheet information to share because I think it's, it's clearly something that people are hungry for and are, are looking for elsewhere uh, if they can't find it. Thanks, Con. And just as a, a reminder to everybody, we do have our um, summary sheets that will be coming out. We wanted to have them for tonight, but they just hadn't been reviewed to their fullest extent yet to make sure that it was correct. Those will be coming out tomorrow and the, a link to those will be available on the webpage that Sophie provided below. It's the uh, our middle housing webpage. Um, Colleen just asked, is the info covered on Thursday's meeting the same as tonight's information? Um, generally speaking, our presentation will be roughly the same. Um, the questions and answer session, obviously different questions will be asked. Um, a lot of those will be the same, but you can also, those will be posted on our website for you to watch if you aren't able to attend the other information sessions to see if other topics are generated, or you're also welcome to attend those information sessions as well. Uh, Emily, yeah, Emily, I see you can kind of unmute. So I have a question back on a parent lot that has, um, a uh, quadplex that's been detached and you said the all the rules um, will apply to the parent lot but let's say the parent lot like the how much space around each detached house will there have to be so the normal setback so uh let me i'll pull up a quick little visual here You'll have to forgive my my um, kindergarten version of a, a lot here, but let me just share my screen really quick. So, so this is an example. Everybody can see this, right? So, a few thumbs up. All right. So, this uh, is an example of a triplex middle housing land division. 
um, that I sketched using my brain. So it's not to scale or anything like that. But along, so while the units here don't have to have setbacks because these are the middle housing lots themselves, the setbacks still apply to all of the external boundaries of the parent lot. So you still need to be, for example, five feet from the um, interior yard setbacks and the rear yard, and you need to be 10 feet from the front. Um, so all of the parent lot standards, those setbacks still apply. It's only with, so even if these units in here are detached from one another, they still have to have their, the adequate setbacks that apply to the lot as a whole. Hopefully I explained that in an understandable fashion. Um, let me know if you have any follow-up questions, Emily. Um, well, this, uh, this is a different question. So if a building is three feet if, it, if a building is three stories high, the full like 35 uh, feet, and it's five feet from the property line, will there be any requirement for, um, like it can be 35 feet from the five feet from the property line, there won't have to be any um, uh, sloping so that the yard next to it gets more light? There are certain instances in which the solar standards that we have in place, the solar setbacks, those standards will apply. Um, however, there are also exceptions depending on, our solar standards work kind of with using a, a math equation that basically determines how that's calculated. And depending on the angle of your lot and whether or not you'd be impacting the lot next to you by developing it the way you are, that determines whether a solar setback will apply. So. I'll say that in certain situations, yes, you will be required to have additional setbacks or you wouldn't be able to build something as high. But if those solar setbacks do not apply, then you could build that 35 feet or the 30 feet, depending um, along the that side property line. And will there be any special consideration for people and gardens? Those rules apply kind of on the whole. So if the solar setbacks apply then that setbacks required if they don't apply then they don't they don't apply so it's just solar access correct yeah it's it's not like it doesn't matter if you're black it, it's if you're blocking another property so it doesn't matter if there's a house there or if it's a garden it's the, if you're impacting the property next to you okay thank you mm -hmm. Wanted to address a couple questions in the chat. I saw one asking if the information covered on Thursday's meeting is, will be the same as tonight's, and that is correct. We may tweak our PowerPoint a little bit, um, and we would also love to hear from you tonight what worked and what didn't work. If you have any suggestions for making it better, um, also will the Zoom uh, will the Zoom recording be available? Yes, the recording from tonight and Thursday. And we added a third information session um, next Tuesday, the 26th from 7 to 8.30. Those will all be uploaded. Um, they all have separate Zoom links, but that information is um, on the web page. So uh, same information, different questions, or maybe the same questions, and then all of them will be recorded. Um, and then I see a question, Jeff, how do property taxes work for middle housing lots on a parent lot? As we are not the taxing agency, it's not entirely clear to me at this time. Um, I will see, I will reach out to Lane County Taxation and Assessment and see if they'll provide us a response to that. But I would say that given that Senate Bill 458 is still being worked through by um, cities across Oregon, I can't say whether or not that answer has actually been quite hashed out yet at this point. Thanks, Jeff. Um, we still have a few more minutes for questions, um, but I did wanna put up a poll. This is our first time doing a Zoom information session and I'm just curious to hear how you heard about it. And so I will launch that poll. Um, thank you everyone for being here. This just helps us see what works and what doesn't work and if we're missing anything. And, as I said, we are always um, we are always happy to hear any um, comments or suggestions for how we can do this better. Since we'll be back Thursday and next Tuesday.
I'm not seeing any new questions. Um, yeah, thank you everyone for being here, um, for learning more about the Middle Housing Project. If you have any questions um, about how to get involved um, or any questions at all, please feel free to contact staff. Um, I'll put our email addresses in the chat. Um, I'll also put the email addresses that you can provide your testimony to if you are just ready to make your comments. And I just say thank you so much, staff, not only for being so informed, but also making this so accessible. I wouldn't have been able to attend if it wasn't in the evening, for example. So uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Like the feedback. Keep it coming. The other thing that I would just recommend people do that if you haven't done so already that you can sign up as Sophie mentioned earlier uh, at the beginning of the meeting you can sign up for formal notice by going to our middle housing websites or you can reach out to staff to request it as well and that means that you'd receive a written notice in the mail you also have the option to sign up for what we're calling informal notice which would just be kind of general email updates that come from the planning division um, and you can do that as on our website or like i said if you reach out to staff we can help you with that as well Wow, shout out to everyone. All 24 of you participated in the poll. Good job. <laughs> and shout out to the neighborhood associations for helping us get the word out. That's really great. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll say that, you know, at our at our top end tonight, we had, I think it, we got up to 34 people, which is a pretty great showing. And I'm happy that, you know, folks are interested and engaged in this process. I apologize. I sent all of the email addresses to Terry by direct message. So they're coming um, into the chat. <laughs> okay, here they come. All right, we have a couple minutes left, um, but I think at this point, the bulk of our meeting is over. So um, we've already said thank you a lot, but we mean it. Um, and what I can do is save a transcript of the chat. I just saw that great point from Carlene. Thank you, Carlene. Um, I will ensure that I also post that along with the meeting recording um, so that folks can get all of the links and see all of the questions. All right. All right. I think I'll go ahead and shut this meeting down. Good night, everybody. Thank you for talking about middle housing with us. Thanks for coming, everybody.